नमस्ते जय हिंद एंड थैंक यू फॉर ज्वाइनिंग अस हियर ऑन दिस एडिशन ऑफ द राइट स्टैंड आई एम आनंद नरसिम्हन एंड लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन टाइम एंड अगेन हियर ऑन योर शो we have addressed this issue of hindu hate or hindu nisya often times misconstrued or projected as hindu phobia or fear of hindu somewhere there is no reason to fear hindu the the reason is that it it all stems from hate often times we've highlighted intellectuals we've talked about authors and researchers who have been called out for trying to push an effort to dismantle hinduism hindutva etc On the other hand we've also profiled authors, researchers, thinkers and of course sociologists who have come out and said that there is or who have called out this agenda against India and against Hindu. But one question that always rankled and it's also ring, uh, lingered is why why would a group of intelligent intellig- individuals, educated individuals understanding and those who can drive opinion such individuals or groups push an agenda against india and hindus what where does it stem from now an american sociologist professor salvator babonis comes out and says it comes from deep rooted resentment anti semitic just like they had with the view jews now they have it with hindus how can they how can they grow how can they come forward how can they they need to be quelled they need to be suppressed they need to be erased this resentment that's what is fueling this hindu misia that is what is fueling this agenda be it lester be it mississauga or be it new jersey or be it any other part of the world where there is this huge misinformation using the word hindu hindus hinduism hindutva different different ways to brand a nation's prime minister elected twice with overwhelming majority voted rated the most popular leader across the world among the tallest of the global leaders to brand him as a hindu nationalist prime minister comes with a certain agenda to deliberately pick up indexes and data points that will show a nation which is growing at the fa- as the fastest nation grab uh, uh, nation in the world at at an economic pace a nation that is poised to become the world's third largest economy very very soon such a nation to portray it as a nation that is serva- that is perhaps in a huge amount of decay as society is concerned huge amount of penury with its people concerned to try and deliberately project it is there an agenda and does it stem from deep rooted resentment salvatore babons had spoken to cnn news 18 and spoken to us here on the right stand on the 16th of september 2022 but today on the 7th of november 2022 he has written penned a detailed piece opinion piece on firstpost.com do peruse it i'm just putting out some of the salient features the highlights here What does he say? Professor Babonis says anti-Hindu western intellectuals do not fear the rise of India. They resent it. So it's not coming this hate is not coming from it's not stemming from hate also he says it's resentment. They just don't want it. Then just as western anti-semites anti-semites are offended by the success of Israel western anti-hinduists are offended by the success of india they can't accept the idea of a strong vibrant independent hindu majority country they would much rather keep india weak and poor just as their ancestors did centuries ago that's the perception built isn't it you're a nation of snake charmers all you can wear is a dhoti half below the waist naked above the waist that's the kind of perception they have about this country pichhda hua that has no knowledge that needs to be educated that's uncivilized they want to push that continue to push that perception this nation vishwaguru impossible that's the core instinct that's what professor babonis says the anti hindu movement wants to turn india into a pariah state on the israeli model so what they did with israel or attempt to do with israel they now want to do with bharat ladies and men gentlemen the crying the hindu misia that's what we are trying to understand let's go across to our uh, panelists but before that a short excerpt of the conversation 
that we had here on the right stand with Professor Babanus on the 16th of September this year. Your opinion piece on uh, India at 75 through some very interesting observations, uh, especially those about the independent democracy watchers who you believe perhaps owe India an apology. Why do you say so? Well, my opinion Mr. piece is based on a research paper that's been published in Quadrant magazine and now republished on the print in India. The research paper is an examination of the three major democracy working organizations, Freedom House, United States, the Economy Intelligence Unit in the UK, and the Varieties of Democracy Institute Freedom. in Sweden. In that research paper, I examine literally all of the reasons they give for India's troubling decline in democracy since 2018 mm. and have found errors, inconsistencies and I think outright misrepresentations in all of them. What did you find? Was this agenda against India as a country or was this agenda against the BJP and more specifically against Prime Minister Narendra Modi, a popularly elected Prime Minister with a larger mandate the second time around? I don't think these organizations are anti-Modi or anti-BJP, and they're certainly not anti-India. However, these organizations reflect the opinion of the intellectuals, of the experts, of the journalists, of the academics who report back to them. That is, these organizations don't collect their own information. They use information that's out in the public sphere, and they hire academics and journalists to write sections of their reports for them. So a report from one of these organizations may be 250 pages long. The India section is a couple of pages, and that's written on behalf of the organization by somebody. Mm -hmm. So I suspect what's happened is that these reports on India simply reflect the overall opinion of India's intellectual class. Not, not just India's intellectual class, but the expat or NRI intellectual class who are concerned with Indian matters. Look, a professor at Harvard who studies India, who may be of Indian background, has much more influence on a report like this than an Indian uh, author uh, you know, in India who is not connected to international organizations. Mm. The report reflects the politics of those who are contributing to it, not necessarily any conspiracy by these organizations to downgrade India. So the agenda to downgrade India and it stems from a deep-rooted resentment saying how can this nation of Hindus, snake charmers, rise? These pichadas, these people who need to be civilized by us, we taught them civilization, we taught them. How can they be? And it is also being stemmed or penned by those who have gone from here and have embraced this whole Western elitist notion about Bharat. Now let's try and look at some of the instances. There's a report on Leicester clashes that's now come out, which comes out and says there is no Hindutva or RSS extremism involved, whereas it was painted as a Hindutva and RSS driven narrative. Again, politically inclined, okay, fueled narrative. Group of influencers peddled a very, very fake narrative. The influencers have links to terrorism, the fake narrative peddled to instigate violence. This is what happened with the Leicester clashes. This is the, res this is the reality that's coming through. So once again, the academia, the intelligentsia coming together, ganging up to create these narratives that will push a model similar to the Israeli model. Just other them, separate them, isolate them and then box them into a corner and keep them there. This is taught out and that's what was caught out and that's why Dr. Chris Allen at Leicester had to step down because his agenda was called out. Hindu bashing is it steeped in resentment is the question that we ask. And where does this stem from? How many agree with Professor Babonis? How many would perhaps expand on this and also call out the academia in the West? Says they've ganged up with the Islamists. The Western elite have ganged up with the Islamists to push this narrative, which is also stemming from academia, who claim to have authority on India. Well, whether they do or not, or are they coming with a particular prism, we'll get into that. Dr. Makrand Paranswe, Professor JNU, former director of the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, with us, joining us from Florida. Makranji, namaste. Such a pleasure to have you on this show. It's namaste. been a long while. It's a and I'm glad. To be on your show. Uh, and I'm glad that we, it, it's happening. Wasik Wasik, writer and commentator and counter-extremist analyst is also joining us from London. Wasik ji, namaste. Thank you very much. 
Pleasure having uh, you on the show. Sarah L. Gates, Dharmic Ecology, Hindu human rights activist, joining us from Australia. Sarah Ji, I apologize for keeping you up so late. I know it's late in the night, but it's very kind of you to have made the time and agreed to, to stay up and speak with us here on the show. And uh, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi Vishwanathan is with us, author of Snakes in the Ganga, co-author with Rajiv uh, Malhotra Ji. Vijay Lakshmi Ji, you are very, very candid when I was there on the book launch when you called out the academy about what they are propagating and what they are teaching. So, Thank Makranji, you so much for having me, Anand. Yeah. So, let me start. Uh, uh, Makranji and Vijay Lakshmi Ji, you are both joining us from Florida. I wonder what's happening there that the intelligence has <laughs> gathered there. But, uh, but let me ask you, Dr. Vijay, uh, Vijay Lakshmi Ji, let me ask you first. Would you agree with Professor Babonis when he says that this stems from a certain deep-rooted resentment and those who are offended by the rise of Bharat, this academia pushing this narrative. Uh, Namaste, Anand. Uh, yes, partly, but I would also blame the Indian uh, elites and Indian educational um, institutions as well. So, for example, if you look at uh, uh, an up-and-coming newly minted university like Kriya University in the South, which lacks total competence in Indian knowledge systems, but they have assembled Western academics to earn the credibility as an institution of eminence. Now, this does not come for free. This alliance with Western uh, universities does not come for free. They have alliances with Yale University and MIT, and this doesn't come for free. So what does CREA give back in return? It, CREA gives back a whole lot of data on 200 Indian, just for one study, you know, 200 Indian villages data on their um, uh, every family, uh, 10,000 households, they have economic data on them. So that, that is given to Yale University. And this is in um, the repository of Yale's big data. Now, so that's one kind of payment. The second kind of payment is they, they, uh, they promise to uh, uh, breed a new uh, set of scholars and students on the Western ways of thinking. Now, what does th this is not just limited to social science. Now, if you take economics, there's a Korea University professor who has joined hands with a professor in Harvard University at Cornell to produce a paper on uh, caste based, uh, how castes are segregated and to show segregation based on caste. Now, Professor, there's nothing wrong with that. If that is indeed uh, an area that should be studied, fine. But these are so one-sided because Professor Vaidyanathan, who's a great scholar who knows um, Jati-based, Varna-based uh, economic systems, has written extensively on this subject to show how caste networks are actually very beneficial to uh, the success of certain communities. But this research, of course, is ignored. So you can easily say, you know, see that it's a one-way street on this. And mm -hmm. Professor Vaidyanathan is cancelled, is never included in any of this. There's another uh, Kriya professor, he's just a master's in neuroscience or something, but he teaches writing in Kriya. And he says IIT, you know, he talks about science education and even science education is criticized like this. He says IIT is a hotbed of discrimination, IIT survive on casteism, IITs mm. produce caste to continue the myth of merit. This is all from Korea University. And uh, then he also goes on to saying Ayurveda is inexorably linked to uh, caste and casteism and promoting Ayurveda equals promoting caste. Now mm. this is coming out of Korea. So we have to question how are Indian billionaires who support Korea University and Korea supports this kind of scholarship mm. and in the name of freedom of academic expression and uh, this whole ecosystem. So we also have to take some blame. We can't just, uh, you know, Pass assign the all West. the blame to uh, Western scholars and Western mm. uh, academics, because if we were rooted and grounded in our own Indic knowledge system that we have a sense of uh, self-worth, we wouldn't be doing this. So so it's happening at an individual level. It's also happening at institutional level. The new right. institutions we are building, unfortunately, are built like this. And that will scale up this whole thing even more. Hmm. But, the, but the academia or the acad uh, that we are leaning on to, to add value and prestige and heft. And like you said, the give and take or the quit uh, counter happens, the quit pro happens. Is, is with, with a lot which is already leaning in a particular way or it's conditioned or thinking in a particular way. Saraji, one of the interesting things that Professor Babon has told me when I spoke with him in September is that look at how they interpret data. 2010 to 2020, anybody who understands statistics does not make a decade. It makes 11 years. 
So you should look at it as 2010 to 2019 or 2011 to 2020. But these people in their research papers use the data point 2010 to 2020 because that's when the number fits the narrative when they are trying to make a case of an indis, uh, index. But he also turns around and says that Freedom House Economic Intelligence Unit or we them, they do not write these papers. They commission it to academia who send them these reviews. And they send them a one-page review and a note and they add it to this entire assessment. So where would you stand? Do you, would you agree that there is a deep-rooted resentment? Why would somebody want to have an agenda against a nation they got nothing to do with? Well, the agenda is it's, it's very old. It, it goes back and it's just morphed. So you had colonialism and then you had neo-colonialism and you had all kinds of different geopolitical strategies in place. And one of those strategies uh, was to fund scholarship. Uh, so you had... Uh, American um, and British uh, institutions funding scholarship uh, and they would guide that scholarship so that it was directed in a, a particular manner um, and they would selectively um, decide what types of topics would be allowed to be studied and so forth. So this has been going on for generations. It's certainly nothing new and I think that um, having studied the history of the word use of Indophobia, Hindu, Hinduphobia and anti-Hindu uh, sentiment, anti-Hindu legislation, uh, there's a, around uh, nearly well, over 200 years of, um, you know, documented usage of these terms throughout the, the Western media and throughout the Indian media. And each, to, each one of those usages is a story in itself. So for every word use, you have to go and read, you know, 10 10 or 20 other things to find out what context that's in. But there's been uh, absolute vitriolic hatred, um, you know, pitched against Hindus from so many different um, directions uh, for such a long time. And I think it's very important not to blur it all together. So you need to know your perpetrators, you need to know your crimes, you need to know who's saying what about whom and when. Um, and it's all very specific and it's all very complex. So I'm reluctant to uh, say that uh, anti-Hindu sentiment, Hindu hatred, uh, Hindu phobia, uh, which is actually a lot older than Islamophobia, it's 60 years older than Islamophobia, mm. um, and it was coined by a, a Brit. Um, so I'm reluctant to say it's any type of particular mentality. I think it's very dangerous to start saying it's fear or it's hatred or it's apathy or it's you know, it's resentment because it is so diverse. When you look at the cases, if you do case studies on what is anti-Hindu uh, hate crimes, um, anti-Hindu legislation, uh, anti-Hindu policies, anti-Hindu um, narratives, anti-Hindu historic studies, I mean, this is just so far, uh, far widely spread and it's across uh, every, every domain. It's in media, it's in academia, it's in think tanks, it's in um, government reports like what we've been talking about. And if you dig down into those references in these uh, reports, some of them are absolutely absurd. Uh, and, and you've just got to wonder what type of academic standards these institutions are upholding. So what I found uh, more recently is the in internationalization attempts of mm. uh, political lobbyists Yes. Um, particularly those um, concerned with uh, P Palestine, Kashmir, the CIA plus NRC, um, the farmers' uh, issues. And then, of course, you've got issues of Islamism. Um, Palestine was, was connected to some of those protests. And you've mm. got, you know, major um, unrest that's been connected to um, these policies. Mm. Um, but it's, it seems like it, it, there's, there's agendas to internationalise um, India's policies or its bills, resolutions, um, in order to have uh, foreign countries interfere with India's democratic um, status, mm -hmm. its democratic process, its legislation. Uh, and I think this is why we're hearing a lot of um, trumped up allegations. Mm. Uh, and some of them are just absolutely, you know, absurd. Like I've read one report. I think it was the London School of Economics. It was something about WhatsApp groups and how BJPIT cells were driving communal hatred. And if you actually read the mm. report, the outcome was that lower caste people, Muslims and other groups, Christians and so many other people were actually committing the crimes. 
Uh, mm. So it really defeated their whole narrative. Um, it, it's just uh, so many logical inconsistencies. So, um, no, I don't think it's just resentment. I do think there's geopolitics at play. I think institutions yeah. are accountable. Mm. And I think this has been going a long time. Mm. And it stems from anti-pagan, anti-indigenous, you know, anti-native sentiment, mm. uh, which was instrumentalised to colonise um, the global south. And if they could have their way, I would suspect that they want to balkanise India. Balkanise Because India. it keeps everyone yeah. under control. It keeps them fighting. Correct. That's uh, my perspective. No, and, and, and you add a lot of weight to that perspective because uh, Professor Babonis in his... Uh, uh, opinion piece on First Post actually hints upon this. He says that this yeah. is how the entire colonialism, this narrative was created and they want an mm. extension extension of the same. And somewhere, uh, the, does it ring a bell, uh, Dr. Paranjpe, when the Sarag Elgate says that it gives these nations a reason to interfere with our affairs, to get into, you internationalize India's policies, international laws, so that it gives them a reason, oh, this nation needs us to get in, so we are getting in. It justifies their encroaching upon our space and somewhere this word dismantle rankles so be it hate be it resentment be it offense be it however let's just take them down yes absolutely anand this is not new you know a hundred years ago when india was striving for its independence a similar series of attacks uh, not just on india's political aspirations but on its culture its religion, its civilization were mounted. And we can go back to Sri Aurobindo's wonderful defense of Indian civilization, uh, which was later published, a series of essays that he wrote in his uh, journal Arya, mm. starting in 1914. But it was later published as the Foundations of Indian Culture, where you can see that there is an orchestrated attempt, mm. as you said, to take down India. But here's the silver lining. I mean, I always try to, you know, strategically look at what, uh, you know, we can get from this, from uh, how we can benefit and learn. And this is what Sri says. You understand a particular alliance against India, a particular mentality, and knowing your adversaries, because mm. I'd like to say that Sanatan Dharma has no enemies, yeah. but only adversaries, okay? Mm. But to be innocent about your adversaries and people who want to destroy you is really foolish. Yeah. Uh, so it gives you Shatru Bodh. Yeah. That is, you get know to understand who the enemy is. Mm. And just to add to what the previous two speakers has, had said, I would call it an alliance, uh, at mm. least when it comes to the intellectual and cultural and civilizational attack on India. I would call it an alliance of red, woke and green. Mm. Now, if we have time, I'll spell it out. Yes, but the red stands for the, you know, the rump, the remnants of the failed leftist, uh, Marxist, uh, you know, uh, Maoist, urban Naxal, call it what you will. All of those uh, splinters and groups which mm. uh, want uh, a weak India internally, you know, breaking India is very convenient for them because they have the delusion that there'll be a proletarian revolution in one form or another. And their outposts in the Western Academy, whether you call them post-colonialists, subalternists or whatever. So there is the red and then the woke. Now, this woke alliance is, to me, a quintessential anti-intellectual alliance, anti-critical. Mm. They want to bully you into uh, basically suspending your judgment, suspending any rational inquiry, yeah. evidence-based thinking. And uh, it's, it's really a programmatic approach to bully you into all kinds of positions of political correctness or incorrectness as the case may be. Mm. And their favorite bugbear, or I might even call it smoke screen, is this whole business of caste yeah. without even understanding that caste and jati, varna and jati are totally different systems. Yeah. And in fact, it has been proven in Indian political history in the last uh, 75 years that, that caste alliances and mobilizations are a vehicle of empowerment and upward mobility. And this history they've completely mm. ignored. And finally, we come uh, mm. to uh, the, the green. And the green is is a, is a kind of insidious 
uh, worldwide, often Pakistani funded, uh, you know, think tank, lobbyist, uh, and other coalition of interests, uh, which are, uh, for lack of a better word, we can call them not Islamic, but Islamist, hmm. uh, which are uh, really attacking, uh, you know, all varieties of Hinduism uh, uh, under the uh, excuse of attacking Hindutva, you see? Yeah. So, you see this alliance of, of, of red, woke and green uh, playing out this anti-India, anti-Hindu narrative in different iterations mm. uh, in the Western world, in the United States, in Canada, then in UK, Australia, New Zealand, everywhere. And now they're attacking Rishi Sunak as well because he yeah. goes to a temple, he celebrates Diwali, they attack Tulsi Gabbard. And so this is going to be relentless. What I want to say is that we should look at it as an opportunity because when Washington Post, New York Times, The Guardian, BBC, CNN also, your so-called parent or partner mm. channel, mm. when they all attack India, then people like you, Anand, and others in India will stand up yeah. and hit back. So this rallying of India and Indian forces, pro-Indian forces, uh, a kind of awakened uh, Hindu conscience uh, all over the world, in UK, in Australia, and in the United States and elsewhere, is a fitting response. And this, this is really good. We have to wake up and roar. So it's not time for defense anymore. It's time for offense. Mm. And uh, I, I want to go back uh, to what was said earlier for a moment. Indeed. It is time to actually name names and see how this alliance uh, works in India. And, and how it's it's weakening us from within yeah uh, and uh, we have to we have to expose this alliance and create counter narratives you see yeah uh, and uh, invite other partners see this is a big failure on the part of India Gee. for example that uh, you know we are not a part of any conservative alliance anywhere in the world hmm. you know uh, uh, whereas the left liberals, are completely integrated, you know, Correct. for example. So we need to have alliances. We have to reach out to think tanks. We should find common cause. And I'm very grateful to the other panelists who have joined from different parts of the world because I see like, uh, you know, like the sparks of a firefly all around. I see signs of this renaissance, signs of new alliances. Okay. And I must thank you uh, Anand, for your, uh, I should say, very persistent campaign, which is highly informative to Indian audiences who tend to, uh, you know, be very ill-informed about this global uh, anti-India and anti-Hindu campaign. So well, thank you for this. Well, thank you. the thing is, I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to rise from three feet to about 30 feet while trying to bring you down from 30,000 feet to about 300 feet. So then everybody can get a perspective which you have. And then when I say all you, all of you, because you've been writing, talking and seeing this. I'm going to bring in Vasik Vasik because thank you for your patience, just allowing everybody to air their thoughts. Vasik, where do you stand on this, uh, this matter? Would you, would you believe that there are parallels with Israel and with Bharat? in terms of when this kind of narratives are fit and are there alliances that have been stitched, especially among the intelligence here, to try and drive this narrative? Is there a commonality? Well, yes, I think there's uh, some truth in that. And uh, I think it's a mixture of uh, a number of things. So, um, first of all, there appears to be a Western civilizational bias against sovereign nations such as Bardet and Israel. Mm. Now, these are relatively new um, nations that have uh, emerged um, as a result of um, the independence, uh, whether that's uh, the formation of Israel or the partition of Bardet uh, and, the, and the formation then of Pakistan. But we need to put this into context. Colonialism was bad enough when it first reared its ugly head. But it seems some in the West are hell-bent on shackling Bharat back into mm. the chains of colonialism, both literally and intellectually. Now, the state of Bharat is a secular one, but the civilization for thousands of years has very much been rooted in the Hindu tradition. And what this does is that this poses a threat to Western leftists and Islamist extremists. So for the West, it shows that Bharatiyas are autonomous, sovereign people that can and have succeeded as Bharatiyas in academia, in culture, in economics and philosophy. 
And what this does is that it leaves Western leftists in a state of rage because they can't act like the world's police and sort out the savages, so to speak. Mm. And Western yeah. leftists, they hate this. They despise the fact that Tabarat can survive without their intervention. And then let's have a look at the Islamists. Now, for Islamists, Bharat is a prime example of a nation that has flourished without the need of a caliphate ruled under Sharia law. Um, so if you have a look at, uh, for example, your uh, population, you've got one of the biggest populations of Muslims. Now, Bharatiya Muslims are living their best lives and proving to the Islamist mullahs that freedom of religion is best served in a nation rooted in the Hindu uh, tradition that uh, provides freedom of religion, is best served in a nation rooted in Hinduism, and it, um, it is clearly one that is much better than the supposedly one that's ordained by um mm. by these islamist extremists so if you ask me why there is this unholy alliance between western leftists and islamists well there's your answer Bharat is a success story and that time and time again keeps proving itself against these natives mm. let's put this again into uh, perhaps uh, economic uh, terms yeah. so according to the imf uh, the world economic outlook the year ending uh, April 2021, the gross domestic, uh, gross domestic product per capita of Bharat in 2021 was projected at over $2,000 at uh, current prices. Now, if you take it back to all the way to 1993, yeah. Bharat's GDP per capita was 6.5% of global GDP per capita. So we saw that in this respect, there was a uh, increase of 18.4% uh, in terms of GDP. So you yeah. can see that Bharat just keeps um, outperforming uh, so many other countries. It's not an accident that it is the fifth largest um, uh, growing economy in the world. Right. It's a fact that it is. And it's a fact that um, this is through uh, its um, civilization, through um, it, uh, everything that it's gone through, whether it's uh, through colonialism, the terrorist attacks that it faces uh, almost daily uh, from Islamist extremists, uh, from separatists from some of the surrounding nations that uh, um, it is, um, mm. uh, you know, uh, facing uh, in, in the same way that um, Israel also faces that. Um, and so when we think about Bharat, we need to be thinking about it being a success story. And this is despite intervention from Western leftists right. or um, Islamist extremists. We don't need a, a, a caliphate. Bharat is very well served as a secular state and also one with a deep-rooted Hindic um, tradition. Right. I've got. I've run out of time, but I'm going to push this for another four minutes. One, one minute to all our panelists again, just to summarize, saying how do we correct this? What do we do? So I'm going to start with Vasik Vasik, go to Dr. Paranjpe, Saraji, and then end with Vijayaji. So yes, Vasik Vasik, how do we counter this well, intelligentsia think, uh, mafia kind of thing? Yeah. Well, I think we, we, we need to counter. We saw uh, recently in Leicester the removal of an academic from a official review. And the reason why that was the case is because we were calling out uh, some of these naysayers, some of these people who wanted to mm. present something against uh, British Hindus as if they were a threat or whether the ideology of Hindutva was a threat. And we need to just keep calling them out with facts, with logic, uh, with a good level of intelligence that is not being provided against us. So we're, we're being provided with emotions but if we can provide with uh, logic with the uh, facts uh, i think we can uh, quite clearly uh, defeat some of these uh, people who are hell-bent on destroying Bharat as a nation mm. counter information disinformation and also a very informed uh, uh, counter if that is provided that could be a solution dr paranjpe yes i think that it has to be countered at multiple levels at the level of the government and the state they have to hire lobbyists in Washington, London, and other parts of the world. Let's not be innocent. There's lots of money and lots of you know, powerful people who are against India. And the government, with its resources, must, in my view, do more. Secondly, when it comes to civil society and when it comes to India itself, I find that we spend most of our time fighting with each other, attacking each other, and in a way disincentivizing competence you know i always say in india we have a competence deficit coupled with competence phobia hmm. uh, and that needs to end we have to open our own minds and there has to be a healthy spirit of self-criticism uh, uh, amongst us as well 
but uh, I think that it's not enough just to attack people. Mm. We have to create better books, better research, uh, better, uh, more reliable, uh, you know, uh, narratives of our own, and that's happening slowly. Yeah. But it won't happen unless we invest a lot of time, energy, and incentivize excellence within India itself. So incentivize excellence. One is information. Start creating a compre, you know, counter mechanism. You also said we need cohesion. Uh, everybody who has the alternative and wants to fight back needs to work together, but also need to up the level of competence internally. Saraji. Uh, I think incentivization is fantastic. We certainly need to incentivize the youth to take up different um, degrees, especially, and I will say this, humanities. <laughs> we need to take up Dharmic uh, social justice frameworks. We need to draw those social justice frameworks from our traditions. And I, I, I do feel um, very much part of these traditions and I've done a lot of work uh, to create my own epistemology and methodology that is absolutely drawn from the teachings of my Sampradayas. Mm. Um, and this should be welcome in academia because indigenous knowledge systems are now uh, being protected within academia for every other indigenous culture around the world except for Bharatias. Mm. So we also need to fight this um, at the systemic level because we do have human rights. Uh, as much as people are entitled to criticise and they can even make horrible statements about you uh, online, if they're working in a particular industry and they're subject to codes of conduct or if these institutions have policies, they're meant to protect you. Those policies are in place to make sure that we aren't all hurt mm. by the people who are working in these institutions and charities. Yep. Um, the media, they're subject to certain um, regulations. Some of them aren't. The Guardian is self-regulating, which is tragic. Um, and they don't listen. But we have to keep uh, making the complaints and do so in a way which is um, very legalistic. Mm. Rather than complaining about my feelings being hurt, you have to be very legalistic. You have to look at the criteria when you're making a complaint and you need to be able to demonstrate that those parties have actually breached some type of code. If yes. it's a human rights issue, it's a, if it's a civil rights issue, it's, if, if it's a housing discrimination issue, every level of society has protections in place already. We don't need to tell them yes. uh, not to be anti-Hindu bigots. Uh, that's already there. You've got protections. Mm. It's just a matter of fighting for uh, your rights. Mm. Everybody needs to fight for their rights. They have to be brave. Mm. They can't be what... Um, Lord Krishna would call impotent cowards. We can't have this anymore. And this attacking each other, bringing each other down, fighting among one another, it's real. It's its really crazy. I mean, yes. fighting over whether we should use terms like Hindu phobia or Hindu misia is just crazy. You're going to throw away 150 years of, of word usage over yeah. what? It doesn't mean, well, it means so many things use if both. you look into it. You, you understand both. these things and yeah. everybody we need to work together we need to uplift one another absolutely and and be one one movement because our mm. enemies are one very, very rightly are, said very, you know very. it's almost the fighting for the ummah yeah. they're fighting for every muslim on the planet mm. so we need to think in those terms and not just for hindus no. also for other pagan civilizations very, very, other indigenous cultures very, very rightly said all and indigenous Jews. Yeah, no, all indigenous yeah. cultures uh, need to be need to be protected, and you, like you said, that you cannot be important cowards. Very rightly said, and more importantly, more need to be taught the basic core indic systems or the local sampradayas, indigenous sampradayas. So, so Agastya Gurukulam has to be now not 400 students but 4 million Vijayaji. So that's what needs to happen. Uh, and and those who study humanities should not should have the ability to question their teachers and correct them. When they try and uh, subtly tell you that uh, you know pedophilia is all right. Yes. Um, also, till such time, like the other panelists have said, that we build our own uh, 
uh, drishti to solve these issues uh, there are some things that we name on uh, in the snakes in the ganga mm. so one thing we can definitely do is to bring awareness to our billionaires who are so the support structure has to be dismantled you know yeah. the support structure that is enabling this kind of narrative to come through and break india that has to be essentially countered so we have to essentially dismantle that so our billionaires are funding that so we have to call them out and say what is going on and let's have an open argument if that's what they feel then that's fine but we need to have a debate on these issues so that is number 1 hmm. number 2 is our gov- own government uh, for example the uh, nep has a lot of issues they're bringing in these gender ideologies into the uh, classroom for k to 12 so we need to counter them our government is sending our bureaucrats to harvard for training and hmm. what are they getting trained on Mm. is also the same uh, narrative they're getting yeah. indoctrinated to so that they can go back into the bureaucracy and and propagate this so we need to call out our government on this right yep. so it's it's good you know fine to blame others but we also need to you know keep our clean up our own house right uh, and so we need to call the government on this and say you know the uh, Mm. Niti Aayog has all experts from Harvard to solve uh, problems of India. I think we have enough brain power to, uh, you know, this colonized mentality that we have, right? That anything from the West is great has to go, and we have enough brain power locally that we can use. Uh, we have, like I said, professors like uh, Professor Vaidyanathan and others who can bring in and give advice to the government on what needs to be done. They have a better idea as to what India needs, as opposed to g- getting foreign help for these things. So even the government has to be. cleaned up right mm. and then as at a family level we should tell our parents uh, that send children abroad for a liberal arts education to not do that not spend the money right. till such time that we develop these fields of excellence at home on the ground so till that time we can at least stop the you know the the right. leakage of all of this so why should we spend our hard earned money on a liberal arts curriculum that is Uh, essentially making well, well, uh, you know well, vijay ji uh, i have i have i have to wind up but it circles back to what sara ji dr paranj pe and vasiv gasik have also said that we first need to learn to work together and cohesive and unite because that's why we always like an uh, an other or somebody from the outside to come and do it because we can't work ourselves together that's why we are all conversing in english and not sanskritam or any other original bharatiya bhasha there is a reason why because everybody said let us get english because we don't want hindi others said we don't want tamil a third said we don't want bengali or marathi so that's where it all got stuck frankly and imagine if we were all speaking our own bharatiya bhashas our own cultures our own knowledge systems would have also been preserved because that's one way to erase it it's a longer discussion and i hope to have that soon with the same panel very very soon but for the moment i have to wind up anand english is also a bharatiya bhasha don't now. worry <laughs> now 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 english is very much a bharatiya bhasha don't now, worry now 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 namaste namaste thank you so much thank you so much always a pleasure dhanyawad thank you we're going to take a short break ladies and gentlemen when we come back what's happened in canada in brampton where uh, once again in a temple the mayor of the region patrick brown has been called out because of this brazen anti hindu propaganda and more importantly an anti bharat propaganda the khalistani flags being waved hindus being derided trying to create this narrative that sikhs are separate from hindustan and hindus and that's what is stemming it's a very very brazen political effort dangerous one we talk about it when we come back stay with us